Kena Kato, Kena Kato, Kena Kato Kato, Nami Hinui Kia Kato Kato, Kia Papa Tunku, Kena Kwe, Kita Fai, Kena Kwe, Kena Kato Kato. And welcome to the people who are zooming in. So they are being looked after by none other than the chair of Hikawai. <laughs> Uh, and if you wonder what Hikawai is, it is the Technology Centre of New Zealand. Right? So uh, they are in very safe hands. So thank you very much. So uh, everybody, welcome. Ko Greg Morgan Pako Ingoa, Ko Ota Ko Adahi, Ko Amatahi, Ko Oaha, and Ko Oti Inapata, Ko Korero, or Tamaki Makoa. So I'm Greg Morgan, Head of Digital Solutions and Innovation at Auckland Libraries. I'm one of the quietest members in the lead team. <laughs> And so I will be your MC this evening, uh, which is obviously quite hard for me because I would have to project up. And uh, a very warm welcome to our special guests, to Gloria Perez Salmeron, President of IFLA. Welcome to you, Gloria. <laughs> and Gloria has also resurged this evening. She's <laughs> up all energy. Ready to go. <laughs> who's the Secretary General of IFLA. <laughs> Murder Edmondson, General Manager of uh, Libraries and Information at Auckland Council. Closing to stay season. <laughs> Alison Doby, our absolutely favourite retired person. <laughs> Louise Lahat, immediate past president of the Anson. for Winnick 2020. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I just said maybe didn't turn up. <laughs> Librarians from public libraries, tertiary libraries, schools, special libraries, national library, you know where you're from. Welcome to you all, you're all special guests. And Kalofalama to our Pacific colleagues, and it's great to have a, a good contingent of Pacific Information Specialists here this evening. Welcome to you. Thank you for being here. Uh, Gloria and Gerald have been in Wellington and Christchurch, and they've been seeing a lot, and they're on their way to ARIA Online next week, so you have got a very busy schedule of events. so it's fantastic to have you with us this evening. Uh, I am going to... What am I going to do next? No, I'm going to hold you in suspense. <laughs> this is a time for us to be united in our passion for libraries, museums, archives, galleries, and information generally. E te ana te kōrero o tato tūpano. Waiho i te toipoto, kaua i te toipoto. Nō re, tēnā tūta, tēnā tūta, tēnā tāko katoa. Right, now, the big reveal! <laughs> I want to show you something. <laughs> So here is the logo for 2020. The moko or blue privilege, a highly respected tonga and symbolizing culture, knowledge, and treasures held in libraries and information repositories. Let's say the three words together. Open, Open trusted, united. And that is a wonderful logo, so it's going to really be a mark of distinction. We will just wait for the social media, people do their social media. <laughs> <laughs> All good? <laughs> you can move on now. Right, thank you. That's excellent. Now, uh, we will be following the uh, normal practice of ensuring that every person who speaks uh, has uh, their words um, solidified through water. So there will be a song. However, what we're going to do is just suspend our disbelief. So we will listen to all of the speakers. And then we'll sing the water at the end, and we'll use the Lianza one. So we can just take people on trust <laughs> that this is all fact, right? This is true news stuff that people are bringing you. And then we'll do the water at the end uh, as a celebration of everything that has been shared this evening. So I think that's pretty much how we go. And the first speaker, so we, we go kind of local, regional, international. That's kind of how we go. 
So the first speaker is uh, my colleague Merla, who is going to speak to us about something exciting that has been happening at Auckland Libraries. Welcome, Merla. Round of applause. Is there a photo? My fairy mato on the Tamaki Makoto and he met his poor new ki a koto katoa. No my harumai ki Tamaki Pato. Ko Merle Edmondson, ko Merle Edmondson, taku e ingoa, ko o te amorangi o ngā, pā, ngā pātaka ko te rau tamaki mkaro. Nō reira, nō mai, piki mai, i raro i te koroai aroha. On behalf of Auckland Libraries, welcome to you all. Uh, my name is Merle Edmondson and I'm the General Manager of Auckland Libraries. And this evening, I'm, I'm my presentation is very short and sweet, but I'm delighted to share the story of Kura, Heritage Collections Online, which was our gift to Aucklanders for our Auckland anniversary weekend. So in, in the 1860s, a former governor of New Zealand, Sir George Grey, made an extraordinary donation to the people of Auckland that founded the public library and became the basis of special collections that rank alongside the holdings of national or state libraries. Items in our heritage collections date from medieval times to the present day and come from around the world, although there is a very strong Auckland and Matauranga Māori focus. Uh, in our collections, the John A. Lee collection, the J.T. Diamond collection, our New Zealand Māori manuscript collection and our God Defend New Zealand original score and lyrics are all inscribed on the UNESCO Memory of World New Zealand Documentary Heritage Register. We've been digitising for many, many years uh, to make our heritage items discoverable and accessible. However, those digitised collections have been offered via multiple platforms and approaches to metadata. And many of you in the room were probably involved in various of those platforms. I can see people in the room today that have been part of that. So finding the content on those multiple platforms and approaches to metadata has been really hard for our customers, especially once we became one Auckland Libraries network. So 40 plus databases have run on a number of end of life platforms. There's been limited browsing and no single search across all the content. We've had various metadata standards, and I can see the catalogues, catalogues among you quivering at the thought of that. Um, the software that was you know, no longer supported had become inefficient and outdated, and provided for only very limited web publishing. Not all of the content is digitised. For example, only 5% of the 2.5 million heritage photographs are digitised um, today. And over 2,000 audio recordings still being transferred onto a stable media. The heritage collections of Auckland libraries are highly regarded by scholars, but not well known to Aucklanders generally. So that's been one of our biggest challenges. So we set out to change that guided by, the by this design challenge. How can we position our online heritage collection so that we communicate to existing and new audiences that is massive, easy to use, and important to the lives of everyone connected with Auckland? So our project really set that as our challenge. In 2016, we selected OCLC's Content DM as our single platform for making content available. Uh, and providing a single search and browse experience that would meet the needs of both researchers and leisure browsers. And that was really critical to us. We wanted to meet the needs of both those discrete audiences who we know have quite different needs in approaching the information. Kura Heritage Collections Online was launched on the 23rd of January to coincide with Auckland's anniversary weekend. Records in Kura are highly discoverable. They can now be discovered through Google uh, without coming to the library. Our heritage records now show up in Google searches without users coming to, the, to our site. The single search is quick and over time we'll be improving records so that facet searching supports users' um, common needs. For example, uh, you could search by Hapu or, or Ewe. 
People can conveniently search by decade, language and documents and various information types. It's easy for people to share records on social media, print search results or order high quality prints of images for which there's a charge. Kura dramatically improves access to Auckland Library's unique content and will grow customer use and demand for more content to be digitised. We're already a leading contributor to images um, on Digital New Zealand, Digital NZ, and more content will be harvested from us because of our, of our single platform approach. Almost 1.5 ex million existing records from other platforms will be upgraded and transferred into Kura and new, newly digitised content will be added all the time. Of course we're doing all that tidying up of use guidelines as we go, aiming to make it easy for people to share and reuse the content they find in Kura. In the future there will be opportunities to incorporate non-library heritage records into Kura, heritage collections online, information held in other parts of council. <laughs> 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 Polynesia in the eastern area and to the south what is 
um, jokingly known as Macronesia, Australia <laughs> and New Zealand. So. <laughs> so the Pacific Libraries Network includes people from all of, or mostly all of these na uh, nations, with the main gaps being Nui, Tokelau, Tonga, because we have not yet been able to make contact with library or archives people working in those nations. So I want to introduce you to some of our colleagues uh, across the Pacific. The network is for all librarians and others working in the information area across the Pacific. What we've come to learn is the importance of being inclusive, because the people, particularly those who work in Pacific Island nations, have many roles. They work with responsibility for national libraries, national archives, public libraries, schools. They include responsibility for universities. We've included people who work in special libraries, including such as the Reserve Bank Libraries, the Pacific uh, Commission, Pacific Islands Forum. So it's intended to be inclusive because this is too small a group not to be divided. We have to think as one sector. It also includes people from related agencies such as UNESCO, uh, the education and cultural um, sectors of government and aid agencies because this is how we will make impact by bringing everybody together to understand the role that libraries can play in the Pacific, particularly in supporting the SDGs. I want to introduce you to just six of these people some of the many stars and movers and shakers who are doing extraordinarily innovative work with tiny resources. So we start with Tiwata, who is from Kiribati. She looks after the National Library and the Archives of Kiribati, and she's also very heavily involved in the international disability community. And her work at the moment is desperately trying to record information and retain that information which is already being flooded due to global warming. The loss of Kiribati is horrifying. Next we have Opeta who is a national archivist and also fulfills a national library role in Fiji. Um, he has taken the approach of ensuring that the people of Fiji know that the Tonga, the treasures in the archives um, belong to the people and he takes those treasures to the communities and reintroduces them to the community and as such has built a level of engagement and um, support for the archives that he has trebled his budget um, in the last year because of his ability to advocate. Leanne works for a philanthropic organisation that takes books to the wilderness areas of Papua New Guinea where there are no roads. She takes books and literacy programs and she sits down with kids in the outdoors and introduces them to reading. Salu, who if you um, join the Pacific Libraries Network on Facebook, is known as Fiji Librarian. <laughs> and every day she posts an example of how libraries are supporting the, the SDGs. Uh, and she works in a school library, but in her weekends she has set up a book club for kids in her neighbourhood to make sure that they have a love of reading and literacy skills. Kakaito is the National Librarian of Papua New Guinea. He has introduced a strategic plan for the development of public libraries in PNG, which has been endorsed by their government. Yes, but is the librarian of the Janana Guzma Reading Room in Timor-Leste, so recently freed from its colonialism. He fights for the right of young people who are unemployed to feel valued and to learn, and he fights for the right every year to lead um, gay pride activities in a community that is hostile. These are some of the most courageous people that you will ever find in libraries. They are absolute stars and they represent all of the people who are demonstrating innovation, courage, resilience, determination, passion and energy every day. They are inspiring and they do all of this against the odds. <coughs> the barriers that they face include physical barriers, lack of electricity, internet, physical isolation, the distances, 
these people have to travel to get together are huge. Sometimes there's only one ship or one flight per week. They also, of course, are prone to many natural disasters. The library infrastructure is very poor. The collections tend to be old and irrelevant and often full of um, poorly thought through donations from well-meaning nations, European <laughs> nations elsewhere. There is very little material in the indigenous language and the scary thing is that in fact most teaching these days in the Pacific nations takes place in English and uh, one of the most innovative things that some of these librarians are doing is starting to do story times in the, the indigenous languages of their communities. There are many social and educational barriers including hierarchy that prevents career progression and I've already mentioned many misguided aid efforts that tend to be ad hoc and focused on the infrastructure, whereas the strong voice of the Pacific community is that the investment should be in the people and the leadership and the capacity and their ability to advocate and the rest will follow. And the islands themselves, of course, face major challenges um, and they have lots of other priorities. They are among the world's most vulnerable and most developed nations that grapple with survival in terms of climate change and sea rise, health, depopulation, language and cultural tension. So it's no wonder that libraries are um, a low priority, poorly resourced and with no visibility. And these nations also still deal with post-colonial challenges, as I mentioned, loss of indigenous languages and heritage. And they're now also <coughs> grappling with new forms of economic and political influence from superpowers keen to exploit island resources. So you will have noticed recently the competition between China, the United States, Australia and New Zealand to pump more aid into the Pacific to gain that critical foothold in which China's just done on an island in Fiji in terms of destroying the reef to build a resort. So the Pacific Island um, nations have seized the SDGs uh, as a strong planning platform to help them move forward. And so the Pacific li Library people that we were working with through Aineli Oceania made clear to us that this was an opportunity that libraries would seize um, to advocate, to show how libraries uh, and library services could contribute to achieving the SDGs. And so this was their point of alignment. And so this is, I want to just go through a short history of how the Pacific Libraries Network came about. This is the group that gathered initially in Suva in May and June of last year. It included quite a few people from Auckland, some of whom are here or on Zoom, such as Judith Baruch, uh, Trina Ania, and uh, others that have been involved. But 30% of the groups missing from this photograph because of a tummy bug that was going on. <laughs> So here's the steps that we took. Aineli Oceania, which was investing in emerging library leaders, leaders operated from 2014 to 18, and we decided to hold our final convening in Suva in May. And we decided to combine that with inviting broadening and inviting a lot of additional librarians to join us for an advocacy training day and using all the work that was done around advocacy in the SDGs. And then the following day, we invited a lot of additional stakeholders from that wider sector to tell them the story of how libraries can contribute and support their work. And stakeholders from the education, culture, development backgrounds were astonished at the extent to which libraries could actually support them in their work. And the energy of that was such that they realised that they could be more effective by working through libraries and that libraries have to be at the table and part of the wider conversation. So as a result, the energy on that day meant that there was a commitment to a statement of intent, purpose, goals, compact and a decision to form a network to continue to work together. Uh, and so then we published Compact, we did some crowdfunding to enable five additional Pacific Island nations to become members of IFLA. Uh, we held a kickoff convening in Brisbane in September with a smaller group where we agreed a strategic action plan. 
and four of the people from the network um, put their hands up to continue to lead this effort and they have called for people to be part of the working groups to progress the priority work of the network. And then finally, um, there were some funds remaining from IDLA Oceania, which the Gates Foundation gave us permission to transfer to the Pacific Libraries Network, and we thank Leander for offering to be the, 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 the hold of those funds on behalf of the network. So this is, I wanted to show you the compact and the, what it says. So here's the purpose. To strengthen the impact of Pacific libraries to better support the needs of Pacific communities through collaborative networking and advocacy. And then the context. And this is really, really important for us. It starts by saying we are the Pacific. Because there was a big debate uh, at this point, it's like who is the Pacific? Is it just the Pacific uh, Island nations? Or is it that wider group that includes Macronesia, Australia, and New Zealand? And there was, after much debate, there was a really strong belief from the Pacific Island nations that this was all of us. We're all in this together. And um, that we're all there as equal partners contributing to what we are each able to do. So we are all the Pacific. This is us. This absolute momentum and a sense that this is our time to use this connection with the SDGs to really progress the visibility of our libraries. And we agreed um, eight goals or focus areas. I've listed them there very briefly in the interest of time, uh, but this, these goals and the strategic action plan and the specific areas of work are all available on the website. Um, there's a couple of of points of particular interest to Kiwis and Aucklanders, and that is that the improved literacy rates includes uh, in local languages, uh, and that promote and strengthen collaboration includes partnerships to support SDGs. And also number four, cultural heritage includes um, the celebration of culture, languages, and traditional knowledge systems, and creating and making available resources in indigenous languages. I know that's of particular interest here. So why does this matter? There are many reasons. These are our neighbours. They're like our cousins in libraries. They're our nearest colleagues. Uh, we are a Pacific nation, and especially in Auckland, our Pacifica communities really matter. And also, we hold lots of Pacific resources uh, in our collective collections. The network <coughs> recognises that Pacific people move and live across the whole Pacific and that the needs of all Pacific communities matter uh, regardless of where they are located. The Pacific Islands nations are unique and they have an important voice that needs to be heard, uh, particularly in a global sense because they can bring important perspectives to global thinking and libraries have a role to support that. Um, and having sparked the stakeholder interest, it's, it's timely now to, to move to kind of keep that momentum and get involved in those political decision making forums, especially the Pan Pacific and local forums. So, if we are the Pacific, how do we get involved and contribute? And you see, we already know the language because that says public library belong Port Vila. <laughs> In, um, uh, <laughs> so what can we do? Internationally, there was a strong view that came out of the summit that we should review the IFLA section boundaries to give the Pacific a stronger voice. The Asia Oceania uh, region is simply too large and too imbalanced for the Pacific to have a voice. There's a strong um, desire for focus on leadership development and connected networks internationally, and a strong desire for flexible training approaches such as the Building Strong Library Associations, which needs a kind of a more flexible approach where you've got many nations where people find it hard to get together. Regionally, we need to work together um, more as library associations, uh, including Piala, which is Pan Library Association in Micronesia. And this also asks the question, is the Pacific Libraries Network the opportunity for a Pan Pacific umbrella equivalent to Parvika? 
which is the Pacific Regional Branch of the International Council on Archives, which is a really active group, and where the National Library of New Zealand acts as the Secretariat for Pākehika. Uh, and also their advocacy <coughs> to aid agencies to make sure that their aid is better targeted towards PLM directions and priorities and not to the one-off ad hoc put a new roof on stuff that normally happens. As institutions, we can share resources, such as the Pacific Language Week resources that we developed. I know that Auckland Libraries recently has developed resources in the language of Kiribati. You know, so let's make sure that the people who live in Kiribati are aware of that and have access to them. We can do buddy libraries, we can do sponsorships and exchanges and partnerships. As conference organisers and planners, of whom there are several um, here, we can invite the contribution of Pacific colleagues as speakers and also fundraise to enable their attendance. And as individuals, we can contribute to the working groups of PLN, contribute to any crowdfunding campaigns that are set up, join the Facebook page to share information and resources, uh, get to know our Pacific colleagues and invite their contribution as speakers. So what an opportunity we have with Lianza being held in Monaco uh, this year with a very strong Pacific focus and then IFLA, WL seats in 20 as well. So how do we ensure that these events are truly of the Pacific? How do we enable as many Pacific Islands based colleagues as possible to attend and participate? And how do we use these events to provide another forum for the network to gather and review this progress? So I would say, Pacific, this is, this is the time of the Pacific. We are the Pacific. We can be part of that fabulous ocean that is the Pacific by working together. And this is where you can find more information.
the IFLA or as an organization with uh, many projects and a, a lot of strategies. So this was really uh, the starting of uh, a new time for IFLA. Um, I was uh, running for IFLA president, president-elect at the moment, and there were several things that were worrying me a lot. One was after the trend report, as you know, that IFLA published the trend report that was in the way that uh, information society were using information and what, what, when they were the uh, trends, um, they were coming to us. And I saw that librarians were not in any case involved in the whole trend report. So this was something very strange for me, surprised me a lot. I know that there were experts out of the library field working with this, but it's our opportunity because we are really managing information, giving access to information, so it was a very strange, a, 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 really a very, a very strange scenario for me. Secondly, it was the, I, I, from Spain, as I told you, that and, uh, it was a very strong uh, financial crisis. <coughs> went down, and many libraries, so um, we started to think how to convince our governments, uh, our decision makers, our politicians, the value of the libraries and how much we could do for society. So we started to find the uh, financially what it was good for them. So <coughs> we applied uh, the role, the, 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 I, we say that that lives are an investment, never cost. So we uh, uh, demonstrate to them, show them that for any uh, euro they were investing in libraries, the outcome afterwards, the return was about three and a half or four and a half, depending on the type of libraries. And this is was really uh, a, a way to think in a, that libraries can help but can be really are a source for development for people. And especially we know, because Lorenz, we know that libraries are really good for people and about people, but decision makers, they are not really used to think about in this way. So this was another issue that, uh, for me, uh, changed a bit the report, um, as well the investment in libraries, and I, I really was thinking and uh, we were a bit lazy because we are really good professionals thinking about uh, to organize uh, and disseminate information. We are very focused sometimes in our collections, in our digital libraries, in uh, the way that we are providing access, but we are not thinking the needs of the people we are serving, our users, the citizens. So um, I thought really that uh, it should have, um, IFLA should do several things and I was totally aligned in the way we were working with uh, global libraries, libraries, looking for this new approach to strengthen the library field, uh, working this way, but as well thinking about our change of mindset. Because we are, as I told you, focusing sometimes in things that they are really not the best things. Or maybe we have to change because if we are not going to have a future, if we are just focusing on things that, that they are changing, the challenges. And we saw that uh, with this uh, global libraries, global vision, um, that this uh, is a, as an invention of our presentation now, this process was really good know many things about the use needs, the challenges, also the opportunities we have. So this was many things that I put in my own program. So I do have here an infography, but it's already published, and I saw very clearly what IFLA was doing in its, its own strategic plan, what the legacy new approach was giving to us opportunity to work differently, like the global vision, like the uh, library map of the world, that as you know, is a tool that we are uh, gathering the indicators of many countries regarding type of libraries, connections of internet, uh, staff, etc., and other uh, of 
because there are projects from IFNA, and then many things that are related to our strategy as, as well to this new approach that we have really to do and to think that we can do and uh, start to uh, be all, being all together very well ensembled yeah? like, like a jazz team uh, but especially thinking that every other area we can be an advocate it doesn't mean that at all levels uh, we can really do a lot of things to show to society, to our partners, to the journalists, to uh, media, politicians, uh, family as well, that we can do a lot of things to develop people. And this is the main message I wanted to share with you. So, and now I'm going to leave the Mr. Gerwin. No, still not 10 minutes. <laughs> to talk about the, the global vision because I really think that this is a good process to in, uh, involve uh, all the areas of the world. But first of all, I want to tell you something that I really like. As you know, uh, Spain is an old country with a lot of parts, uh, really old, because it's a historic country, and with uh, a lot of literature. And Don Quixote, to show, is from Spain. And we have that very good several points. And uh, my favorite is Antonio Machado. And Antonio Machado wrote really nice poetry. But one is one of my favorites is Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. That does mean traveler, walker. It's not path. You are making your own path by walking. So it's the way that it is working nowadays. By walking, we are doing our own way. Thank you very much. countries usually to 
together. And I guess it will be so uh, also that it will be in Auckland that colleagues from 120 countries uh, will be there from all types of libraries gathering. It's a great conference with 250 different sessions about all what matters in the library field with more than 500 excellent speakers. That's great to get really the impression, but was, I think what the most important thing is that we can speak with each other, that you can get in contact with colleagues from so many other countries, can get uh, ideas from all parts of the world. This is even more exciting as these great speakers. Yeah, you can build up a personal network, you can get friends from all parts of the world, you can get in contact with them, and this can open windows for all of us, because I have been yesterday in Christchurch uh, together with Gloria in an afternoon speech, um, <laughs> and uh, I saw these new wonderful public libraries, and there are so many ideas, great ideas inside, which I have seen also in other parts of the world. And I guess what happened in, in Christchurch was that their, your colleague uh, was able to go around and to took the best out of several libraries which she saw all around the world and mix them together new and leverage it. And you have such a beautiful, great library now in Christchurch which will inspire, I guess, many colleagues who will come to the Congress next year and see this library and take it in right years old. And this is what we want to do with EFLA. We want to connect you, we want to inspire you, we want to enable you that you can work differently. This is what we intend to do with you. This is a chance. We don't have the power, we don't have the money of governments, but we have the power of you, we have the power of ourselves. There's so much wisdom, so much knowledge in them. But it's your slogan which you brought in, open, trusted, united. This could stand also for EFLA, and I'm extremely happy that the national community suggested this slogan. It's really a great slogan. Some uh, facts about EFLA. It goes on here. Yeah. What we say, we are the global voice of libraries. Yes, why we say it? Because we are the leading international body representing the interests of library information service and their users. What does it mean? We have heard before, and has not spoke about the importance of the SDGs and uh, give such example what is happening here in the Pacific region. And, uh, when you see the SDGs, which is the, the program of the United Nations until 2030 as a program, uh, this was not created from one moment to the other. There was a long process for it to create this program. And what Ivla did in this moment, not in this moment, in this period, was to advocate for libraries, to advocate that access to information is one of the goals which, which is inside, which is important. And this was not a moment, this was the hard work of four years going to the United Nations. And, to, and all your work, what we are here doing, is depending on laws. Otherwise, we couldn't do our work. And laws means also that they guide us on the other side, they can also hinder us in several things. For example, when you think on copyright, copyright <coughs> is uh, all on what we depend, what we can do here. And this is depending on international laws before it can be made here in New Zealand. There is an organization called WIPO, they are the decisions made and they have to be followed then by uh, the national governments. And when we cannot influence here this process, then the laws in New Zealand are bad for libraries. And this is what IFLA is doing in, in many things. This is a bit abstract, but it's important. This is one of the things what we are doing. But we are, as we say, an independent, non-governmental, non-for-profit organization 
with not so many members, but we have the members from over 145 countries in the world. This is an enormous, this is why we say also we are the global voice representing it. That's great, but as you may know, in at the United Nations, 193 countries represented. This means we are missing 48, in the meantime, not 48, but uh, over 40 countries in the Eagle family. And again, it was uh, fascinating what uh, Alison showed us before on uh, this map of Oceania. Especially, we are missing many countries of Oceania. And what a great initiative, what we heard before, this crowdfunding, what uh, happened there to enable five countries to become members of IFLA and we uh, intend to follow this way because IFLA want, wants really to be strong in the region, work more in the region and I have to say in the past we were not so concentrated on Oceania. This is a blind field for us, we have to do more here and we have the best will to do more but we can do it only together it's not IFA, which is abstract. IFA, that should be we, as you said before, we are Oceania, we are IFA, we are part of the global movement in this way. And uh, here to say, uh, would be great to have all these more than 20 countries on it, then we are very nearby the country. This is our plan uh, to go for, and I guess it's a good chance also with the Congress uh, here in Auckland that we could come nearer to this goal. Uh, our headquarter uh, is in uh, Den Haag, in the Netherlands, in, at the Royal Library there. Uh, it's not very big, we have there around 20, 25 colleagues working. What is uh, exceptional with these 25 people is that they are not only incredibly engaged and motivating and working very hard, it's very fine to see, as we are a global organization, they are coming from uh, 19 countries of the world. This means we have really uh, good mixtures there and uh, coming from different continents. And it's a, a really great work with a great young team. And we have several regional offices uh, in Buenos Aires, uh, Latin America, in in, in Africa, <coughs> South Africa and Pretoria and we have one for this big Asian Oceanian region. Tell us uh, all the stretches then, from Turkey to Easter Island. Yeah. <laughs> and this is one thing where I totally agree we have we have to think about it. About this region. Region does it really matter. I will tell you something later that we are on the way to this. And uh, what we else have is we have so-called language centers because when you uh, visit our website, the IFA website, you will see all major documents. Our website is in seven languages. This is also unique for an organization. There are not many international organizations. Uh, they are translating in, in seven languages. This is an enormous hard work to do, you, uh, you are also unique because you are going with two languages very often what I have seen in your, uh, on your websites, uh, we are going with seven languages, all translating, it's also expensive for us and we are not a rich organization, we are depending on, on membership fees and on donations and uh, some uh, uh, services which we are selling, but we think it's uh, one way to inspire people and languages are barriers. Not all uh, are frequently speaking English uh, or uh, they can speak only in their native language and so uh, we don't want to uh, leave librarians in the world behind. Also you can say seven languages are not enough but it is a lot. And you will be fascinated when you join, uh, when you attend at the Congress uh, here in Auckland, you will see also that all major sessions are simultaneously translated in these uh, seven languages. It's mainly 
also enormous for a conference, which makes our conference also for us expensive uh, with simultaneous translations in, in seven languages. This means you will hear also people, uh, uh, speakers in Chinese, and you can um, hear it as you want in English or in another language. Uh, yeah, and but what is even more important is, uh, I guess, what matters for you is that we have the biggest brain trust in the library. At IFLA, we have we are organized in so-called sections and standing committees. Sixty of them, and they are working around. 1,200 top experts for IFLA and for you, creating guidelines, standards, support for the type of field. We all know, especially now with IT, technology and so, you can only communicate when you use the same standards. You know it, easy thing from the past, uh, cataloging, if you don't follow the same rules, you will never find. So it's even more extreme now with IT uh, and these experts are working on guidelines on support uh, for the global library field and it's a chance also for you to become one of these members. You can apply for it, we have currently elections for it, it's a bit too late now but it's never too late two years is again the possibility and maybe you are fascinated after the congress here in Portland to become one of the members you can get in contact, you can discuss with them you can be part of it that's a chance uh, for our personal, individual development but also for the development of your library because it brings value back to uh, your library this is an exceptional thing uh, and I guess this is the biggest treasure of IFLA. This, these people who are working for IFLA and for you. And if you have questions between, don't hesitate to ask. Also between, not at the end, maybe when it's too much. Good, this is a short overview about IFLA. We want to be an open, inclusive, participatory organization. What is it? That's nice to, to see it here, you can stand on a paper, but what does it mean, really? You read it often, the open, the inclusive, participatory. I think we are going this way and we are showing that we are going and that we are doing different as in the past and that we want to inspire also other organizations to do it in this way because we are creating our future, the future of our organization in a very different way as it happened the last 90 years of IFLA. This means we want to create uh, a future together with the input from librarians of all over the world that not our governing board or I as Secretary General say we have to go so, we have, you have to do that, and you have to do this. We are interested in what you want, what your ideas are, to create our future together because we think that all in a time of globalization global answers are needed and when, you, when you think and so, so many companies in the world in publishing especially because colleagues from uh, the academic libraries know the big publishing companies are acting worldwide selling products worldwide but dictating on another way also prices and, and you are not allowed to discuss this with others any strange things what we don't want and what we want to avoid and to overcome yeah this is the reason why we started this is global vision process and I will give you some uh, information about, but it should not be your information that you go home there and say I've heard something. I want that you be part of it, that you start to be, get involved in it, that you uh, be one of our people. We asked, uh, we started 
two years ago to ask very simple questions, six very simple questions to leaders in the library field, but also to very simple librarians, to all librarians, and I would like uh, to show you how this happened. Did some of you participate in this? Uh, did one of you give answer to this? Wow, good. We have several here inside. That, that's great, really. Because you, with your answers, you are influencing the way IFLA is going to do. Uh, we saw here worldwide an incredible engagement, which exceeded really all our expectations. We had high expectations, we thought there will be some thousand people, we want to have some thousand people to get their ideas from all parts of the world. But what happened was a real incredible success. When you see this, this is the outcome from the first round which we had. We uh, started with a group, with, our, with an expert group, well, two years ago, these were the officers of this 1,200 people from this special interest group with a kickoff meeting in Athens, where we assembled them and asked them the question. They discussed it two days, and then they went out and went to their standing committees and discussed this again with you and wrote reports about it. And in this way, we got answers already from 1,200 experts to these questions. Intense discussions, always two days long, uh, from absolute experts. But it was clear we wanted not only to have this group, we wanted to have the few of different countries of the world. Therefore, we organized so-called regional workshops in uh, Europe, in North America, in Latin America, in Africa, in uh, the Arabic region, and in the Asian Oceania region, in, in Singapore. It, and there we invited the uh, representatives, mainly from library associations or from national libraries, to get their view, and they discussed there also two days about what could be the future of the libraries, and created here. A, and then they went home, and many of them organized in their countries again workshops. This means we created with this workshop a snowball effect. With small meetings, it's been growing, growing, and growing more participants. And have, so, as you see in this workshop, more than 9,000 participants uh, they discussed intensively uh, this question and gave uh, feedback. There are not many organizations who are able to create such things worldwide with workshops with 9,000 participants. But what we wanted, we wanted to have more. And then we set up an, an online platform where we got the feedback from 22,000 people from all over the world. And all together we had the response from 190 countries, from all continents of the world, from all library types, from all generations. And this was enormous. 600,000 answers to these questions. What was a great success but on the other hand, an enormous challenge for them. What to do with 600,000 answers, what you have? 600,000 answers are again questions, what to do with them? Yeah. And we worked then with a uh, US company uh, several months on it to structure it, to get it together. And with this input, uh, we created the so-called Global Vision Reports, the answers from the global library field to it, and uh, made a summary of four, in four pages, 600,000 answers, uh, and you can get this on our website, you can read it, and I would really encourage you, go to the IFA website, read it, you can read this in four pages, and if you want more, you can read 700,000 pages, <laughs> and you can get all of it. Here just some uh, highlights. There was is one key finding, on the one hand it was really enormous, but to see we are really globally united in our goals and values. Uh, Alison has shown us before how complicated the, the life on this island is and uh, the work there, but the values are the same.
same as in a US library to do it. And this was a, was really a great outcome. But what we see on the other hand is uh, that we must better connect global and local actions because local, the local diversity is enormous. Also we have uh, these goals. And this is a challenge for IFLA for the next year. And this is one of the reasons why we are thinking to go lower to regions, to, to reach more out and to organize it different. And in this report, when you will see, it is organized in 10 highlights what we think, what we are making already, where we are good at, what we are doing excellent. And we combine these 10 highlights where we are good with challenges or opportunities for the future. And I want to give you a short overview about it, just to get a, full, a first impression before you go to our website and read it. As I said, one key finding, 10 opportunities to unite the global field. We are champions of intellectual freedom. We are for access to information needs also. We have to be champions of intellectual freedom. We have to change our traditional roles in the uh, digital age. Community needs to understand better what our community needs. And we have to change also our work with ongoing uh, technological changes. And what is important, every librarian and advocate, not only your leaders, you have to go for otherwise we don't change it. Stakeholders have to understand our values. And only when we work together, we will reach it in collaboration. We have really to structures and uh, opportunities to get. And we have to maximize the access to uh, heritage. What I think is most important to give the next generation the opportunity to give our young leaders and our new professionals an idea where they can go and to give them the chance to go there successfully. And this is just a start. We need ideas how to do it. These ideas will come uh, in a so-called idea store where we are going for now uh, to create it. This idea store are we creating together because <laughs> such a vision <laughs> without execution is isolation. That is it. And do you want to hallucinate or do you want to have the connections together? For this we are going and we, are, we do it in a participatory, inclusive way. Otherwise, all these are paper, and we show that we are doing it together, and therefore we are creating all librarians of the world together, the biggest idea stores for actions to inspire each other, like it happened in Christchurch, so we want to do it worldwide, to do it together. And um, what you see is that we have this global vision report summary now, with so many ideas from 190 countries of the world. And the next step is that we co-create together this global vision idea store for action. And, the, and what is the goal is here? To inspire here on the one hand, IFLA, the governing board, to create a strategy which fits to your needs, which fits to your wishes. On the other hand, that this idea store is a source of inspiration for every librarian in the world to get good ideas out from other libraries, to be inspired, to work with them, and to create powerful actions for a globally united library field. This is the intention. And we started this process in August in Kuala Lumpur last year, and we got an incredible response from all over the world. We have already more than 8,500 ideas here inside to these 10 opportunities. This means we are on a journey where we are creating really the biggest idea store for libraries to enable and to empower ourselves. And this is a journey which we are going. We already uh, we have reached several milestones, but we are just on the beginning beginning really to go forward 
with full power. And here you see the EFLOW development roadmap. We are, we are here where uh, the EFLOW governing board is working with these ideas which came in from the whole world to develop a strategy. And we are discussing now this strategy with our professional units. And we will create with them work plans for EFLA and we will launch the new EFLA strategy in August 2019 at the Congress in Athens. And uh, this should help librarians, uh, give them support and motivate also to work with us. Because only when you do it in a similar way, uh, we will succeed. And what we are, what we are, what we do is next after uh, August 2019, we will reach out again to the regions and we'll discuss it with library organizations all over the world. How can they contribute? Because the EFA strategy is not an order. What you have to do, it's an offer that you come with us that you do it similar, that you do partially similar and get the support of IFLA and that you are united with uh, the work of other librarians in the world. And what we are doing then when we have uh, the strategy process uh, in August finalized with a new strategy, we're going in a so-called governance uh, discussion where we will change the IFLA governance it should be more <coughs> orientated on the regions. This means we are able to change our structure. And this is what Alice said. I can say we will change the structure in by each other shape. We see this with the input what we got uh, in this discussion. Yes, and this should be for us, but in the the final goal is to do it for our society. We are doing it not for library, we are doing it for society to power and literate, informed and participative societies. But we can do it only together. Come on board, go with us. Together we are strong. And show that show what we can do together. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving us that slogan. I love that slogan about the vision without execution of being hallucination. <laughs> I'm sure it's not supposed to be a slogan of attack, but it might be quite useful for some reason. Um, so that, um, you know, that's just given us a really good context, and thank you, Gil, for the overview. I think the overview of, um, you know, many of us would have participated in that survey, but I probably haven't paid too much attention to what's being done to grow the conversation. So I think the overview gave us a strong sense of the kind of timeliness of this international collaboration <coughs> in a world that is in a peculiar place. And Gloria, thank you for your words and well. thank you for being uh, up at different ends of the day. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to do now is we are just going to look at this again. So that we can enjoy the um, just enjoy that logo one more time. We opened with Kalikia and we will close with the uh, Antawata, which will be our closing Kalikia. It will also be to consolidate what all of the speakers have brought to us this evening. And uh, then please stay and as we say in New Zealand, mix and mingle. <laughs> this is when people will come galloping up to you and they will quiz you on what you're seeing. <laughs> uh, but first of all, a round of applause for us. And Zoom friends, feel free to sing along. Um, you know, just activate your lounge. And Louise is going to take us on that. Thank you.
and chat for a while, ask questions, and uh, go well this weekend. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.